All right, we're going to eventually make our way to the book of Galatians this morning, but before we do that, I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15, we'll read several verses together and then move to Galatians. 1 Corinthians 15, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, bless your word this morning to our hearts. Help me to speak the truth in the way that you would have it spoken. And may we all receive it as it is indeed in truth, the very word of God, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now look at verse number 1. Moreover, but then I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So the gospel, according to the Bible, is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That is the gospel. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse number 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So, baptism is not the gospel, and the gospel is not baptism. Everybody see that? If you believe the Bible, that's what, that's what you believe. Romans, Romans chapter number 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 28. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Without going into any detail this morning, there is election in this verse, and there is the gospel in this verse, and people who are part of the election are enemies of the gospel, so then election is not the gospel. Baptism is not the gospel. Election is not the gospel. Everybody, everybody see that? All right, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 6. And if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So, salvation can be by works or by grace, it cannot be by a mixture of both. If it's works, it's not grace. If it's grace, it's not works. Everybody, everybody see that? All right, Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. We'll get to Galatians here in just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So, you can't be saved by grace and works. You have to be saved by grace or works, and the Bible says it is grace. Therefore, it's not works. So, salvation is not by baptism, it's not by election, and it's not by works. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's by the grace of God when you put your faith in the gospel, and the gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and the third day rose again. That makes Galatians not only a very, very blessed book, but a very, very tragic book. And this is why. Turn to Galatians chapter number 1. And let's read together verses 1 through 10 as we begin our study of this epistle. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, hallelujah, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel 
the ear so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that troubled you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, here's why I said this book is a very tragic book. 2,000 years ago, people were being saved, converted out of Judaism, out of paganism, out of idolatry, out of devil worship. You read about all that in the book of Acts. And, and they had no New Testament in writing. And so there was a great deal of confusion about whether or not these old forms of worship should be carried over into Christianity or were equal to Christianity or should be made a part of Christianity. And so the Holy Spirit of God had the Apostle Paul write this letter to the churches in Galatia and from there it was, was spread abroad to all the churches so that we would know and understand that the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ completely and entirely replaces all other so-called gospels insomuch that if anyone tries to continue these doctrines, these teachings, or insert them into or incorporate them into Christianity, they are to be counted accursed. And 2,000 years later, almost every minister in your town is preaching something this morning other than the gospel. You can understand that 2,000 years ago when God had not spoken and addressed the matter, but he has. And 2,000 years later, how is it that men and women are standing in pulpits this morning and saying, be baptized and you'll be saved. Do good works and you'll be saved. Serve God and you will be saved. Do the best you can and you will be saved. I got a New Testament, another testament from an angel. And I can't emphasize it enough and you get weary with me saying it, but I'll keep saying it until I die. The issue is whether or not you believe this book is the Word of God. Because the only reason people are preaching accursed doctrines and calling them Gospels is they do not believe the authority of Scripture. They believe in the authority of denominations, the authority of priests, the authority of pastors, the authority of their imagination, believing it's God speaking to their heart and giving them liberty to believe something the Bible doesn't say. Anything but this book. But if God has spoken in His Word, we do not pronounce curses upon anyone. We are supposed to recognize that they are accursed. We don't curse people. But we certainly don't follow the teachings of people God says are accursed. Amen. There are two reasons the book of Galatians is written, and both of them are found in these first ten verses, and both of them require me to fly in the face of today's religion and the 10th verse tells me not to chicken out but to go ahead with that it would be nice if you could please men and God but if you have to choose between the two it's best to choose to please God and the first of these reasons is found in verse number 4 Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, gave himself for our sins. Aren't you glad of that? Amen. That he might take us to heaven when we're done living a life of sin down here. That's not what God said. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So we deal today in our church and with the influence of other churches upon our church with this idea that Jesus died on the cross 
so you could go to heaven when you died, which is never stated in the Bible, but that Jesus Christ died for our sins so that, first of all, God could forgive you of your sins so you could spend eternity with Christ, not necessarily in heaven, but with Christ, but second of all, so he could empower you and enable you to stop sinning. And a gospel that is presented to men and to women that leaves them as they are and encourages them to continue living as they were living before they ever heard of Jesus Christ is not the gospel. It's another gospel. May I remind you of the verses we just read in Ephesians? For by grace are you saved, thank the Lord, through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, thank the Lord. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. He does not save us by our works, but he saves us so that he can then do a work in us so that our works change. And Galatians is written to take people who are walking in the flesh and transform them into people who are walking in the spirit. It's to transform people who are unsaved and miserable, unsaved and in despair, unsaved and angry, unsaved and bitter, unsaved and unkind, and not just save them and leave them bitter and depressed and angry and unkind, and, but to make them Christ-like. That's the gospel. And if your gospel doesn't include a changed life and a transformed conduct, it's not the Bible gospel. And the second reason for this, this letter, obviously, is to keep people who have trusted Christ from being removed from Him. Look carefully at verse number 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. I, I can say to you after... 45 years of being saved and 40 plus years of pastoring and being in the ministry, I can say to you, I continue to marvel at how little it takes to get people to stop following Jesus Christ. I'm amazed at how little it takes to get people to drop out of church. I'm, a, I'm amazed at how little it takes to get people to turn against their brothers and sisters in Christ. You, you just... You just wonder, how could God do so much for you? How could God's church do so much for you? How could God's people do so much for you? And you could turn so dramatically against them all. So rapidly. It's a marvel. But, but notice from the scripture, I marvel you so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You see... What begins this turning away is a turning away from first, Jesus Christ, but second from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Men turn from Jesus Christ because when they came to him, they realized that this is the only way you can get saved. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. My works have condemned me. There is nothing about me that is acceptable to God. I must trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Now, as long as you maintain that attitude, you will come to him every single day for help, for guidance, for, for direction, for grace, for mercy. But as soon as that old flesh starts setting back in, I deserve better than this. I deserve to be treated better than this. Look how good a person I am. Look at how great my works are. As soon as that old carnal, fleshy mindset that kept you from getting saved creeps back in, it will turn you from the Savior who saved you. If you forget how much you need the grace of God, all you'll begin to see is how somebody else needs the grace of God and how somebody else needs the forgiveness of God and somebody else needs the mercy of God, but not me. And you're turned away. Unto the grace of Christ, unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that troubled you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. And, and, and here's the second thing that turns people away so quickly and so dramatically, and it happens so often because they don't recognize it. If you're here this morning, you're saved, you're a Christian, you believe the Bible, you think, you think the enemy is liberal media. You think the enemy is cults. You think the enemy is Islam or, or communism. You think the enemy is, is perverts and, and sexual immorality. You know what the Bible says in Galatians? Wreck these people. Preachers. Ministers. Proclaimers of a gospel. You're not going to be turned away from Christianity by Islam. You know that Islam's not Christianity. You're going to be turned away from Christianity by communism. You know communism is not Christianity. You're going to be turned away from Christianity by people that worship Satan. You know Satanism is not Christianity. But if some nice person in a pulpit at a desk on the internet opening some kind of Bible reading from some version or some translation and talking nice not like me. Gets out their little feather and tickles your ears. The Holy Spirit is concerned you won't have enough respect for the Bible to recognize an accursed voice when you hear it. And you won't have enough respect for the Scripture to know when you're being misled. If I was the devil, and contrary to what some on social media say, I'm really not the devil. If I was the devil, I wouldn't stand up here this morning wearing the, the costume, the cartoon costume with the horns and the split hoofs and the pitchfork and the red cape and all the rest of that. I would want to look as much like a Christian minister as I could. And I would not take a, a torch and burn the Bible. I would just little by little tell you that word's wrong, that verse shouldn't be there, that rendering's not correct, this, this, this verse shouldn't, is not in the original as, the, as though... What I would do, I wouldn't take your Bible away from you, I would just take away your confidence in the Bible. And I would convince you that the voice inside your head or the feeling inside your heart is of superior authority to what God has written. And then I could quickly and easily turn you away from Jesus Christ and from the gospel and you wouldn't even know you'd been turned. Because the voice that you heard was a religious voice using the name of Jesus. Now, to, to make this obvious... And Satan can be obvious in a generation of people that don't believe the Bible. To make this obvious, the fastest growing, most dedicated, devoted, energetic religion in the world today is Mormonism. You, you are not, all of you who have children are not saving your money to send every one of your children for two years of missionary work. They are. You're, the independent Baptists aren't filling airplanes in Salt Lake City day after day after day after day sending their boys and girls out all over the world to promote their religion. Now some of you are nervous already because you, is he allowed to speak against another faith? Yes, I'm commanded to. Yeah. Is he allowed to criticize people's sincerely held beliefs? We just read it. This is, this is the problem. You get nervous when I say what the Bible says because it goes against how some of your relatives feel. So, so these sincere, dedicated moms and dads send their sincere, dedicated boys and girls to ride about on their bicycles or drive about in their, in their automobiles if, they're, if the elders are old enough to drive. <laughs> and they come to your house and say, no, 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 not the Bible, the Book of Mormon it tells us how to be saved by our good works, and it was given to us by an angel. How obvious can you be? You couldn't be any more obvious than that. 
How do you get, and, and they're converts, the majority of converts to the Mormon religion are people who are raised Southern Baptist. How do you leave a Baptist church and join a Mormon religion that wants you to substitute the gospel for the revelation of an angel that is another gospel? How do you fall for that? Well, because you gave up faith in the Bible. And instead of teaching the Bible, which would offend people, you began to preach other things. And instead of teaching holy living from the Bible, which would hurt your youth group and the size of your, of your, 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 your bus ministry, you just threw out all that teaching about how you're supposed to live. And then along come some people that look like Christians. Well-groomed, nicely, nicely dressed young men and well-mannered and nicely dressed young women, and nobody in your church dresses like that. Nobody in your church looks like that. Nobody in your church is that dedicated to Christ because you threw out dedication to Christ so you can have more people. And so people don't believe the Bible and have been to church for years and haven't heard the Bible or seen the Bible lived, say, wow, that, lo that looks like the real thing. And so, as offensive as it sounds, it's my duty to say to you that well-dressed, well-meaning, sincere, dedicated people who tell you that you have to work and earn your eternal life by your good works are accursed. And you should not reject Jesus Christ in favor of a religion they claim to have gotten from an angel. Isn't that obvious? Now, in the book of Galatians, as we go forward, he's going to address those who are raised in Judaism, who saw no need to obey God's commandments, who saw no need to observe God's scriptures, but who thought they were accepted in the eyes of God because when they were babies, their parents had had them circumcised. And the Holy Spirit said to them, are you kidding me? Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. That didn't pay for your sins. Christ rose from the dead so you could have eternal life. That didn't give you eternal life. And this afternoon, those of you who go out knocking on doors to introduce people to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not spend an hour before you encounter one or two or three or four or ten people who say, I'm a Christian. What makes you a Christian? I was baptized. When were you baptized? When I was a baby. Galatians is written 2,000 years ago to clear that up. How is it that half the churches in town this morning don't feel a need to preach the gospel to the people assembled there because everyone there is a Christian because their parents made them one when they were a little bitty baby? What went wrong? Lack of respect for the Word of God. That's the issue. When we get to chapter 2, chapter 4 of Galatians, you're going to find that, 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 that this book is written shockingly, shockingly. This book is written to people who ignored the commandments of God 340 some days a year, but made up for it by celebrating holidays. And the Lord's going to say to those people who only show up to worship Him on holy days, this is not why Christ died. This is not why Christ rose from the dead. That is not a substitute for genuine faith in Jesus Christ that changes your life every single day. So here's the tough spot that we're in. We can risk, verse number 10, displeasing men by proclaiming the truth of the Word of God that the greatest threat to Christianity in America today is professing Christianity. Or we can just throw out all this Bible stuff and try to please you. 
And how will that fare me and you in the day when we stand before God and we're judged according to his word, not according to how we felt about things? So let's, let's look back quickly now, quickly through verses 1 through 10, just an overview introducing matters. Paul, an apostle, not a man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. So who should be the supreme authority in our lives? One who rose from the dead or one who died and was never heard from again? One who conquered death or one who was conquered by death? Surely the Lord Jesus Christ, by virtue of his resurrection, should have the greater voice among the saints. Shouldn't, shouldn't we hearken to the one who actually accomplished what we're hoping for, life beyond the grave? That'd be Jesus Christ. And all the brethren which are with me under the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. So let's establish, it's, it's obvious, but let's make sure we're all on the same page here. We had sins that needed to be paid for. Is that not correct? I mean, the issue is sins. And I couldn't pay for my sins because I'm a sinner. And you couldn't pay for your sins because you're a sinner. And you couldn't get your mom to do it or your dad to do it because they're sinners. And you couldn't get your children to do it because they're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Christ, see, the only one without sin, gave himself for our sins. It's a substitutionary death that was voluntarily accomplished for you, for me, by Jesus Christ. So what's the gospel? Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. And the third day, Jesus rose again according to the scriptures. There it is, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So if you are saved, God, the only true God, one, the one true God, becomes your Father, correct? So God, beco God becomes your Father by virtue of Christ dying for your sins, and it is God, your Father's will, made possible by the death of your Savior, Jesus Christ, it's God's will that everyone who is saved be delivered from this present evil world. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, here, here, here's what that means. It means what it says, but it's my job to make sure that, that as we learned in Sunday school this morning, that, that you understand what you just read. The world did not become evil when Bill Clinton was elected. The world did not become evil when Al Gore invented the internet. Okay? The, the world did not become evil when you got a shot or didn't get a shot. The world was evil when Christ was here. What, whatever world, if you find yourself presently in the world, the world is evil. That, can, we, can we agree on that? And God has not sent Jesus Christ to save you, to take you out of the present place where you are, but to deliver you from the present evil world. Look, if it's God's will, and, and this is why I say, when, uh, they want to witness somebody say, uh, would you like to go to heaven when you die? That's not the gospel. Can I show you these three verses, and if you'll say this prayer, you can go to heaven when you die. That's not the gospel. You are a sinner. Christ died for your sin. If you'll trust Christ as your Savior, you'll be saved from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. Now, if the gospel was, trust Christ and you can go to heaven, that, that you, you would never wonder if somebody got saved. Because as soon as they called on the Lord for salvation, they would die. 
Call on Jesus and you'll go to heaven when you... <laughs> Lord, please save me, forgive me of my sins. <laughs> he got it, he got it. <laughs> He's in heaven. No, the reason we wonder if people really got saved is because they say they trusted Christ as, to save them from their sin, but they are still bound by the ways of the present evil world. And so there's confusion, there's doubt among your family members, among people that know me. Has he saved? I don't know, he says he's saved, but look at what he did. She said she's saved, but look at what she did. So the power of God is not so that the world will change so it's easy for you to live the Christian life. It's so a greater power than the world takes control of you and like Christ you can walk through this world without committing the sins that this world is, is, is wrapped up in. Praise the Lord. I'm not taken out of this present evil world. I'm delivered from this present evil world. Now, now again, there have been books written, highly successful books, that have turned tens of thousands of churches against the Bible, and as a result, hundreds of thousands of Christians against the Bible. And the strategy is, how do we get the church leadership together and the denominational leadership together and incorporate the world's music and the world's dress and the world's morals and the world's conduct and the world's vocabulary? How do we bring that in and call it a church? And God says, I'm telling you up front, 2,000 years before it happens, you are to consider those people accursed. Jesus didn't die so you could put his name in your rock songs. Jesus didn't die so you could put his seal of approval on your nakedness and your adultery and your, your perversion. And your, that's not Christianity. And the people that are going to turn you from a gospel that delivers you from the present evil world are not people to be listened to. They're not people to be followed. Jesus didn't save you so you could conform his church to the image of the world. He saved you so he could conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And increasingly that's becoming a very despised truth not by the world the world doesn't care but by the people you know that say they're Christians why do we have to do that that's legalism that's the law that's that's judgmental that's narrow-minded that's that's oppressive that's where do you get those words none of those are Bible terms those are humanist terms you got off television So our, our responsibility is to proclaim and promote the Scripture so that people who would turn you away from Jesus Christ and the grace of Christ would not have sway and influence over your life. In verse number 5, To whom be glory forever and ever, amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. From him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. All right, so that, that, that's, those are harsh words. Pervert. Pervert. Uh, it used to be there were certain things that were called perverted. There were certain people that were called perverts. I'm, I'm old enough to remember that, like 10 years ago. <laughs> now verse 5 says, to whom be glory, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, amen, glory, Jesus Christ. So, so listen, you, because, you, you, well, you know, I came to that church a couple of times and I didn't like it. A couple of times won't do it. Amen. You, you, can't, you can't spend your life being influenced by Hollywood and then walk in and get this cold water in the face and be comfortable with it. Well, it's going to take you some, some time. But look, 
If you give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ who conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave for you, died for your sins and rose from the dead, if you give him the glory, it's really hard to give glory to a sodomite, a sports star, a singer, a politician, an internet celebrity. Because you, you look at the guy that scored the touchdown and you look at the woman that sang the song without her, uh, uh, most of her clothes on and you look at the fellow that, that entered office being worth $200,000 and leaves worth $55 million and you look at those people and say, compared to Jesus Christ, I can't give those people a time of day. But if Jesus is no big deal and he's just somebody that asked you to say a prayer after three verses and you never really knew him anyway and you never really cared to know him anyway, you just wanted to go to heaven when you died and you glory in man, well, before long, how can we condemn and just fill in the blank? You can't condemn people who are committing perverted things because you said everybody's wonderful. You can't condemn losers because everybody's a superstar. Look, if you don't give glory to Jesus Christ and instead you give glory to man, you can't decide where to stop giving glory to man. And you end up getting perversion and righteousness confused. It, in the town you live in, on Friday afternoons, a Republican can run for office and stand on the street corner beside an atheist and mock Christians. Because you guys, with your narrow-minded, modest dress, Bible-thumping, you're perverted. And the rainbow flag, and the son might be a daughter, and the daughter might be a son, they're enlightened, advanced products of man's evolution. You understand? If the Bible's not the Word of God, if man is greater than Jesus Christ, you wake up one day and you can't tell the perverts from the righteous people. And that's where you are. And you know who's contributed more to that than any other group in America? The people in the pulpits who won't tell the truth. You're not Christian. Why not? You criticize somebody's religion. Where did you get the idea that that was Christianity? Which is not another. There are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Do you know what the Bible says? The trouble is not the true preacher. The trouble is the preacher who won't tell the truth. That's where the trouble came from. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now again, you don't curse anybody. I don't curse anybody. But the Lord said, you, you've, got to, you've got to see that person for, for who they are. You've got to see that doctrine, that denomination, that religion for what it is. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So what's the issue in the church at Galatia? It's not media figures. It's not entertainers. They're listening to the wrong kind of preaching. The preacher is supposed to counter this present evil world. And you have lived to see the day when the preachers almost wholesale have decided, how can I cooperate with this present evil world? Are we to be kind? Absolutely. Are we to be gracious? Absolutely. Are we to be, be law-abiding citizens? Absolutely. Are we to be gracious and, and merciful? Absolutely. Are we to conform ourselves to this world 
so that people who have rejected Jesus Christ will, will think that we're part of the club? No. No. We're supposed to stand as lights in a, in a dark world. We're supposed to stand as saved people rescued out of the bondage in which others are, are held captive and say, hey, there's a way out. It's Jesus Christ. There's liberty. There's freedom. It's Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll read you tonight the letter of a missionary we have supported since we were meeting in a rented building 30 years ago. And this man and his wife have, have operated a home where girls in, in desperate trouble have had a place to go. Not only be saved, but learn to live a Christian life and, and go on to spend their lives not living as their mothers did and as their grandmothers lived, but, but to live as Jesus Christ would have them to live. And they, his health is such that he can't continue the work and he and his wife are stepping down and, and retiring from that work. <laughs> Forty years ago, Gary Bain led that man to Christ in prison. Now what if Gary had walked in there and said, you guys are okay. You just need to let Christ come into your life. You guys are wonderful. You just need a little Jesus icing on your cake. No, you know what that man needed? He not only needed to hear that Christ died for his sin and was buried and rose again, but that Jesus Christ could completely change his life. So he never had to go back behind bars. And he never had to uh, again commit the sins that put him behind bars. And so he could spend the rest of his life saying to young people, you don't have to live this way. Look what Jesus did for me. And this gospel that leaves you like you're found. And this gospel that never betters you. And this gospel that can't better you. And this gospel that shouldn't better you. Let it be accursed. Christ didn't die so you could stay like you are until you finally staggered into a miserable grave and woke up surprised you were in heaven. Christ died to completely transform your life by the very power that raised him from the dead. And this modern, uh, careful, careful, I, I almost looked to see if my mom was shaking her head. This modern religion that calls itself Christianity but scorns the verses you just read, God warned you about it 2,000 years ago. And how sad it is that so few in, in, in 20 centuries have taken heed to what God wrote in His Word. Jesus Christ has the power to save your soul. And he has the power to change your life. And if a minister doesn't preach both of those truths, you should not listen to him. That's Galatians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. I'm thankful Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. But I'm also thankful that Christ Jesus came into the world to change the sinners who have trusted him. Verse number 10, for do I now persuade men or God or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Now, some people take that verse and they twist it all around and make it say all kinds of things. Uh, well, you know, the reason nobody likes me is because, I, no, no, that's, that's, the context here is not your behavior. The context here is the gospel. And, and the, the admonition is, if the true gospel displeases men, you cannot forsake the true gospel to be more popular. If the true gospel is rejected by your generation, you cannot surrender to your generation. You must continue to proclaim the true gospel. Praise the Lord. Now, just quickly, quickly, and, I, and I, I mean this, I mean this. I'm just going to read to you, uh, just read the verses, and we'll spend weeks on them. 
in the months to come. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That is a list of things that are done by people who are controlled by their flesh. It's not a list of things done by people who aren't saved. It's not a list of things done by people who haven't prayed the prayer. If your life is a manifestation of these things, you have been mistaught. You have not been properly instructed in the grace of Christ. Yeah, 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 yeah. Verse number, verse number 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So, there, there's this list of things that people do if the flesh controls them, and a list of things that people do if the Spirit controls them. And God did not send Jesus Christ to die, and God did not write the Bible, and God did not start His church, so you could keep doing all these flesh things, but so that He could teach you how and empower you to do these spirit things. And the modern church says, Shh, don't talk about these things, don't condemn, don't judge, don't be critical, don't be hateful. So what they're asking you to do is not take a torch and burn the Bible. Just take out the parts you don't like. Just ignore the parts you disagree with. And you know what the Bible said? That teaching, you are to count it as a cursed thing. Now, who could find fault with love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness? But you can't, they, they can't coexist, the, 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 the fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, they can't coexist. So God has written this Bible to deliver us from this present evil. Oh, this world is such a rotten place. Are right. you doing those things in Galatians 5? Well, that's part of the rottenness in the world. He hadn't written, listen, he didn't write this to deliver the world, but to deliver us from the world. Not to leave you like he found you, but to change your life. Oh, there's so much. I, I want to teach the, the whole book without stopping. I just want to go till I, till I, I can't breathe anymore and I pass out and I, I'd be the last one awake. Anyhow, but, but I, because honestly, if you're, if you're controlled by the flesh, your spouse, your children, your parents, your neighbors, they don't want you to say a prayer so you can go to heaven when you die. They want Christ to change your life. Amen. And that's what he can do. That's what he wants to do. The rescue mission last night was filled with men who have professions of faith that they, they said a prayer and they're, they're saved now. Well, why are they still in the rescue mission strung out on dope and, and drinking themselves to, to, to death? Why? Because they've been taught a false gospel. The gospel of Christ doesn't leave you like that. It gets you out of that. Praise the Lord. And that's what Galatians is going to teach us, and that's what Galatians is going to emphasize, and, and I hope that you'll avail yourself of an opportunity three times a week to come and hear and learn uh, from this, this great book that God has given us to change our lives. Praise the Lord. My life needed changing. And if you've ever truly been saved, it's because you realized something had to change. So, the religious world and the secular world, they exert very powerful influence on those beneath its sway. I believe this morning 
that Jesus Christ can produce a more powerful influence on those beneath his sway. So that everything in this world can come at you and it will not, it will not overcome you if you are walking in the Spirit under the controlling influence of, of God's Word. I was at a meeting one time many, many years ago, many, many years ago. Uh, it was a one-time shot, and I knew it when I got there. And it was a, a meeting attended by, by a, a, a thousand people, half of them ministers are in the ministry, and the whole purpose of the meeting was to defend our faith in, in the authority of the Scripture and to warn people against the, the uh, corrupt uh, modern versions and modern translations, and, and all of the doctors that spoke before I spoke did a, did a very good job of emphasizing that point, and, and the last day I got up and said, we've well, heard from all the doctors, now it's time to hear from the orderly, it's my job to clean up the mess the doctors have made. And, it, <laughs> and we went from there. And I, and I, I said to this uh, August company of Bible believers, I said, many of you are here today because you despise the New International Version that has left out 17 verses and some of you are sitting there with a King James Bible and you've left hundreds of verses out of your Bible in your life. You see, if you take a verse out of the Bible in a modern translation, that's not a good thing. But if you have the right translation and you refuse to obey several hundred verses in your right translation, how's that any better? The judgment seat of Christ, it won't matter what book you disobeyed. I got the right Bible. But does the right Bible have you? See, I've got the truth, but does the truth have you? And Jesus Christ died on the cross. We believe that. He rose from the dead. We believe that. To pay for our sins, we believe that. Which statement is followed by a comma, not a period? He died to pay for our sins and to deliver us from those sins. And that's what we want the Lord to do for you. That's what I want the Lord to do for you. That's what I want the Lord to do for me. And it's my job as a preacher, Galatians 1, to preach that. And hope, hope that you will receive it. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Pray God this book of Galatians as we uh, make our way through it this fall would be a tremendous help to each one that will avail themselves of the teaching of your word and we thank you for it Lord and, and uh, appreciate you giving us the Bible so very very much in Jesus name we ask and we pray amen let's sing number 129 standing together number 129 careful on the last line make sure you speak the truth in love